you know, I've thought deeply about music. I've, I've tried to figure out why it has, what it represents and why it has the effects that it has. And I think, and this is a neuroscientific view of it to some degree. And, you know, it seems to me that it's better to think about the world as, con as something that consists of patterns rather than as something that consists of objects. So an object would actually be a pattern that sustains itself across time. It's, that's not all that... Uh, very, very good insight. I, you get applause for that. Well, thank you. Thank you. And so, so then you think, well, for, you can even think about the way the visual system works this way. So, you know, we tend to think that there's a world out there and then there's an image of that world projected onto our retina and then the image is, is reconstructed, say, in our visual cortex. And then we, uh, then we, we can become conscious of that image and plan our actions in, a, in, in consequence of that. But that isn't how it works. The way it works is that there are patterns in the world and then the patterns are shifted into patterns of light, of illumination, and then those are shifted into patterns of neural activity on the retina. And then those are shifted into patterns of neural conductance along the optical nerves and then patterns in the visual cortex. And then those are expressed as patterns of movement. So it's all the transformations of patterns. And the meaning of a visual perception is the pattern of action that it gives rise to, which is why you need embodiment to be able to perceive. And I think the reason that music speaks so deeply to us of fundamental meaning is because it's actually the most representative art form. You know, because people think about it in some sense as the least representative art form. I don't think that's right at all. I think it represents the reality that exists in a profound sense beyond what our senses reveal to us moment to moment. And so it puts people... Then when you're moving to the music and you're all moving to the music or when you're dancing, let's say, with someone else and you're, and you're as pairs and you're all dancing together, it's the, the patterns of the cosmos, so to speak, manifesting themselves as the patterns of the music, manifesting themselves as the patterns of your body in, in syncopation with everyone else. So it's also a symbolic representation of a harmonious and ideal society. And there, it is something that's beyond us. And so... It's, it's interesting. So I get it. So, so partly what you're saying, if I understand you, is that for you, the, the ecstatic collective experience that was associated with music, for example, and pop music, perhaps, was you could see that very clearly as the antidote to painful isolation. And, and I mean, one of the things that struck me as, as, as struck me as near miraculous about music, especially in a rather nihilistic and atheistic society, is that it really does fill the void that was left by the death of God. And it's partly because you cannot rationally critique music. You know, it speaks to you, it speaks of meaning, and no matter what you say about it, no matter how cynical you are, you cannot put a crowbar underneath that and lift it up and, and, and toss it aside. And no, so I also like think that's that. why music was so, such a powerful cultural force in the 60s and the 70s, and like an overwhelmingly powerful force. So well, the other, the other element that's very important to this is music is the voice of a subculture. So when you tell 100 million kids who felt utterly isolated and alone that, they, that their experiences had not been reflected in the experience of any other person on earth, that in fact they are not alone, they are a movement, um, you give a subculture a voice. And you can see that with, well, when I finally got into working with music, one of the first things I did was work with country and western music. Now, Jordan... Uh, I worked with a company called Dot Records. I, I was hired by uh, Gulf and Western to found a public and artist relations department for their 14 record companies. And one of those companies was Dot Records. And Dot Records was number three on the country charts. And uh, that it was a third place company. And it wanted to be number one uh, in country and Western music. Now, when I was a child, when I was about three and a half years old, um, I woke up on a Sunday before anybody else in the house had, had woken up went out to the front room where there was sunlight, which I didn't get to see as often as I'd like, and turned on the radio. And because it was 6 o'clock in the morning or something like that, what I got were farm reports and country and western music. This was in 19, 1946 or something like that, or 1947. And I immediately knew that that music was alien to me, and I knew that it was the music of another subculture mm -hmm. that would not necessarily be kind to the subculture from which I came. So I never liked country music. But in the 1970s, when I got this position with Gulf and Western, one of the things I crusaded for the hardest was country and Western music 
because I felt that these people had a right to express their identity. I felt they had a right to get beyond the ghetto of the Bible Belt, which is where they were kept and where they were suppressed. It was an era of subcultures finding themselves and expressing their right to exist. It started you know, music, with music really does seem to have that binding capacity, you know, and I think there's also something neurological about that because, and tell me what you think about this, if this is in accordance with your observations, but it seems to me that the music that people listen to as they're catalyzing their adult identity, say between the ages of about 14, 15 to 20, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a real intense, um, period of neural pruning that occurs at the end of adolescence. So you get right. a tremendous amount of neural, pr neural pruning after, uh, after you're born in the early stages of infancy, because you have a lot of neural connections and then a lot of them, you kind of die into your childhood self. Right, you're, you're born with twice as many neurons as you will actually need. Right, right, exactly. And so, so you're, you're a massive possibility and then you die into your actuality. And then that happens again in late adolescence, right? Which is also when, when schizophrenia develops because that process seems to go wrong for some people. But as you're dying into that adult identity, one of the things that seems to catalyze that is the music of your culture at that time. And that also seems to unite you in some way underneath rational thought with the people of your generation let's say with the people you'd have to cooperate with and compete with and so there's something really deep about that too that's not well understood and 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 so i well so i i don't know what you think well, about well, that. the second element of that because it's a brilliant observation and the second element of that is that in your late teens your prefrontal cortex gets wired up now what's the prefrontal cortex it's probably we talk about it as the the center of administration in the brain executive functions um, its primary job is making you human. What does that mean? You would think that means encouraging certain things like creativity and thought. No, the job of the prefrontal cortex in making you human is to repress things. Um, it's to damp things down. It's to inhibit things. And you are learning which things to inhibit after you've become utterly grafted into your subculture. And what is one of the elements that has grafted you into your subculture? Music. And so what Freud would call the superego is formed to a certain extent based on your subcultural connections that you've developed as a teen. Right. And again, music helps identify that subculture of which you feel a part. Right. Well, okay. So, so partly what's happening there is that because music is poetic and also it, it's poetic and emotional, let's say, it also constitutes the the pre-rational substrate from which the values of that subculture emerge. So it's like the, it's part of the mythological substructure of the values of that culture. And you can make absolute that. sense. Yeah, yeah. You can see that expressed in the lyrics in particular, right? right? And where, which lay out a system of values in some sense. You right. You already but, see that with something like hip hop, for example. Well, roughly 95% of the lyrics in pop culture are about mating. They're about mating rituals. They're about courtship rituals. And you, as a person whose weight, the meeting has been upgraded by the best and now includes, okay, God knows what it was trying to tell us. So at any rate, um, you have just emerged from childhood. Um, your hormones, your sexual hormones have begun to act. Girls as young as 11 can become pregnant already. Um, and you are obsessed with uh, finding your place in the world and finding a mate. And courtship rituals mean an awful lot to you. They're about to what they're they're what you are about to embark on for the next ten years of your life at least, um, and so this obsession with courtship rituals, with mating and dating and breaking up and and betrayal and all of that kind of stuff, makes makes absolute sense. Right, exactly. Well, and the thing is, music frames that too because it gives you something that's in common with your potential mate, and it also gives you a set of rather. I wouldn't say stereotyped activities, but at least predictable activities that are associated with courtship and mating. And so that would be going to concerts and going to movies, which are heavily musically influenced and dancing and, and even discussing your, your shared immersement in whatever that subculture happens to be. So right. And my guess is that at some point, music provokes oxytocin because oxytocin is the ultimate bonding hormone and music is a bath in the sense of human belonging, mm -hmm. in the field that even if you're alone and you're listening to Pandora or Spotify all by yourself, it feeds you social bread and meat. 
and in the in the uh, nervous system, the central nervous system, everything boils down to inhibition or excitation. Mm -hmm. There is a hormone of excitation, and it's glutamate. There is a hormone of inhibition, and that's GABA. And oxytocin feeds down into the GABA system, the system that keeps you calm down, basically. It gives you a sense of peace. 